Great to see you. Grab a Bible if you don't mind. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. It's where we have been for the last few weeks, where we're going to be for the next few more. So uh, you, might, you might accidentally memorize this entire little passage of Scripture before we're done. But it's really important that we stay there. So Matthew 6, it's going to be page 831 if you're using an evergreen Bible. So uh, turn there. And then we're going to spend some time in a few minutes in John chapter 6, which is just a handful of pages to the right from Matthew 6. So turn to page 831, and then you might want to find your way over to John 6 uh, in a few moments and join us there. We're talking about uh, prayer This whole series is called the Known Series, and I hope that you've been using the booklet that we prepared for you. It has uh, daily readings in there, weekly memory verse, and then small group discussion guide for you to have some conversations with people about what you're learning. And I hope you're uh, using this. If you are new, say, man, I'm new. I didn't know there were these. They're still available for you in the area called Next in the lobby. And so you can still get one today and and jump in there uh, with us now. The whole idea is we're asking Jesus to teach us how to pray. And uh, here's my, my realization, you know, that, that the most important thing about you is that you walk with God. It's more important than anything else is that you, that you walk with God. And so, uh, it, you know, most of us feel like, well, I need some help with that. That just seems so mysterious and wild. And while you might actually talk to God, maybe your typical prayer sounds something like this. Help! Because <laughs> we tend to pray a little more when the fire is hot, you know. Uh, but what we're learning from Jesus himself is how to connect with God, how to posture ourselves before God, how to see God for who he is, and then how to engage with God in our daily routine life and invite God's supernatural presence to help us in our life. Now, this is, a, this is such a powerful thing. It is God's desire that you and I would be people who spend time alone with God in the private place so that he can consecrate us, so that he can uh, commune with us, so that he can commission us to a life that he has for us. He wants us to spend time alone with God all the time, like every day. You might be, you know, I've been in this camp for a while where, well, I have a long commute, I turn off the radio, and I just talk to God while I drive. Maybe you're a person who says, I'm talking to God all the time, like for me, Literally, talking to God is an ongoing, all-day-long conversation. I just, uh, because I know he never leaves me, so I will frequently just kind of talk to God like we picking up the conversation where we left off. That's all great. That's wonderful. And there's something about a quiet place all alone with God that does something for you that nothing else can do. And so that's getting rid of distractions. That's creating a space. And here's what I know. I just would bet everything, I, bet, I would bet everything I own on this, that the vast majority of people who fill our churches, who are trying to become, you know, live the Christian life, are neglecting this private place alone with God. Some of us neglect it because we don't know what to do there. And um, that's what this is going to help you do. Jesus is going to teach us how to spend quality time with God, like how, what that conversation can consist of. But here's the goal, that you be alone with God in the quiet place, and then you live fruitfully for God in the public place. And this is the rhythm of life for those of us who love Jesus, that, that are Christ followers. We, we, we are privately healthy with God and publicly fruitful for God. And you can't escape this necessity. This is how life works. And so I just want to keep pushing you, pushing you, pushing you, pushing you until you become. I, I, I am... I am uh, man, I feel like uh, Paul when he said to, to the people he wrote to, he said, I am in the pains of childbirth till Christ be formed in you. I want you more than anything else. Like I want you to prosper financially. I want your marriages to flourish. I want you to raise amazing kids. But what I want for you more than any single thing is that you would know the power of a, of a quiet walk with God all by yourself where you are spending time with God in the private place. He's making you healthy. He's dealing with your junk. He's coaching you and encouraging you and correcting you and, in, and inspiring you. And then you're living publicly fruitful by the power of God in your life. I uh, re- realized this morning when I woke up, I've been a Christian. I became a follower of Jesus at the age of 16 uh, through my dad's death. And so our whole family kind of went into this um, through his cancer battle, this journey of discovering and finding God. 
And so uh, I've been a Christian now for 41 years. That's just so hard for me to believe. Uh, but I'm having more powerful, uh, meaningful, fruitful, life-changing, life-empowering times alone with God than I ever have in my life. And I will tell you that my prayer life is changing because of what we're learning in this study of the prayer that Jesus taught us and returning to the discipline. Because what can happen is you say, well, I talk to God all the time. Man, I just talk to God all the time. So do I. And it can lull you into neglecting this private, quiet, shut down place where it's just you and God as a discipline. Get alone with God. There's, and here's the deal. This is what I hit me this morning. Even if you suck at that, you say, man, I don't know how to pray. I get alone with God and I'm like, I don't know what to do, God, but I'm alone with you. Cool. Even if you're terrible at it, even if you pray all the wrong prayers and you want all the wrong things, you get alone with God. And it's going to be pivotal to your life. So, man, uh, please turn up the heat on your private walk with God, your time alone with God. I, I just know it's a, it's a critical part of your journey. So what we're doing in Matthew 6 is Jesus is teaching us how to do that better and better and better and better. And so we're at verse 5. We're going to go through. Uh, normally we would read through verse 15. I'm going to stop just short of that. And uh, the verse we're looking at today is verse 11. We're at the part of the prayer in verse 11. So if you're able and willing to stand for the reading of God's word, I would appreciate that. It is our, is our custom here. Uh, Matthew 6, and we will start at verse 5. And this is essentially Jesus answering the question, Hey, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? And here's what he says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and up on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Now, many of us have memorized this prayer. And um, we're, say it aloud, read it aloud with me if you have. And if it's, you know, it's, it's a meaningful thing. And yet what we're learning is it's not that God, Jesus wanted us to pray this prayer. He wanted us to pray this way. And so this is really a guiding uh, outline for us on how to pray. This then is how you should pray. Join me, would you? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's the word of God. You can be seated. Thank you. Now there's a part of the prayer that continues. If you have a King James Bible, you still see it there. In modern translations, they have removed it, but it's in your footnotes at the bottom of the page. And uh, it says this, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. And um, in the King James Bible, that's still there. In modern translations, it's not, and here's why. As they found, we have, uh, I don't know if you know this, people say, I don't, how can I trust the Bible? We have hundreds and hundreds of uh, scrolls and manuscripts of the Bible from antiquity and so the, 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 the reliability of the text is stunning, more literally um, reliable than any other writings of antiquity. It's amazing how God has preserved his word. Uh, and some of the scrolls they have found that seem to date the oldest do not contain that part of the prayer. And so the thought is perhaps that was added later as the Bible was hand copied, that that part of the prayer might have been added later. We're going to actually celebrate that part of the prayer in week seven of this series and talk about the glory and the honor and the power of God as we pray. So we're learning how to pray. And today we're at verse 11, give us today our daily bread. Now you're going to say, well, okay, I got that. Give me today the food I need today. Got it. Uh, it's way better than that. So lean into this and let's talk about this. Now, uh, being resourced is a battle. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus told a parable, and he said it this way. He said, um, 
he gave a parable of a guy who went around planting seeds, throwing out seeds. And some of the seed landed on the pathway, and some landed among rocks, and some landed in weed-infested soil, and some landed in good soil. And he talked about how fruitful each one of those were. And when he was talking about the soil with weeds, this is what he said. He said the weeds represent things that come in your life that choke out the activity of God in you. Can I just tell you this? As a matter of fact, God is working in you. You might come in here today and say, well, somebody drug me here. I don't even believe this stuff. I will tell you, God is at work in your life because he is, he is the, the Bible calls him the hound of heaven. He is not going to stop pursuing you till you're dead, okay? That's, that's the truth. Uh, but what happens in our lives is that there are some things that choke out the activity of God in our soul. And Jesus said there are three of them. And they are the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. So as we talk about this part of the prayer where, where Jesus says, I want you to, to say, Father, give me today, give us today our daily bread. Now, uh, he says, I want, you, I want you to, this is a reminder for you to pray in utter dependence upon God. You and I are not people who are desperate for the bread we need today. In fact, the literal translation of that is, give us today the bread we need for tomorrow. That's literally how you would translate that. Give us today the bread we need for tomorrow. In that culture, in that biblical time, um, workers' wages were paid daily. Why? Because they had to purchase their food daily because you didn't have refrigeration, preservation. So they would literally live day to day buying the the things their family needs. And so uh, Jesus goes on, and, and even in more detail in other New Testament writers, criticizing people who call themselves Christians who are not paying the wage of the workers in a daily manner. They need their daily wage. Why? They're utterly dependent on today's wage to feed their family tomorrow. And what Jesus is asking you to do is to become a person who, who places yourself in utter dependence upon God, where you assume the posture of the person, Lord, if you don't come through today, I won't make it till tomorrow. And this is the deal. So uh, for us, it's not that need of daily bread. Um, about 11 or 12 years ago, I went to uh, Malawi, Africa. We had our church. I was pastoring in Denver, Colorado. And we had taken on an uh, area of just outside of the capital city of Malawi called Lalongwe. We took on this village where there was, uh, as in lots of Africa, there was an AIDS crisis. And what we did is we bought 27 acres of land, and we wanted to start caring for AIDS orphans. It wasn't that the kids had AIDS, it's that their parents were dying uh, from AIDS, and and you had villages entirely occupied by children. And um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Africa, the continent of Africa, is 15% of the world's population, but it contains two-thirds of the world's HIV cases. And so uh, we wanted to jump in. We adopted this little place. We were building children's homes so that they could stay in their village because here was the deal about those kids. If they left their village to go to an orphanage, they would lose the inheritance rights of their parents' property. And so we built houses for them in their village so that they could have a house parent, get their education, continue to be cared for, and then when they turned 18, they could take the land that their parents had owned and so um, we, we sent teams there a couple times a year for several years. And uh, I went on one of those trips, and these kids would come out from all these villages while we were working on these homes. They would come out, and they would play soccer near us, and they would laugh at us and talk to us and have lots of fun. They were fascinated by the white people. And um, they love soccer, as most of the world does. I grew up in a redneck part of Texas where soccer was for women and children, but uh, I have since fallen in love with soccer, but... I didn't have that organically. In Africa, they love soccer. And uh, this is one of the soccer balls they would play with. If you can't see very well from your seat, this is plastic bags wrapped in twine. Very uh, amazing. I mean, I've had this for 12 years. They, they play soccer with this. And on our trips, we would bring soccer balls to give to the kids so they would have real soccer balls, which didn't always last very long because they, were, they took such a beating. But I had a ball on my last day of my trip there, and I asked a kid, hey, would you trade soccer balls with me? I'll give you my soccer ball, you give me yours. And so I've, I've had this for about 12 years. And uh, I told him through the interpreter, I said, hey, I'm going to pray for you 
I, I'm going to keep praying for you. And he said, I'll pray for you too. And then on my flight home, I was thinking, I wonder how he'll pray for me because I know how I'll pray for him. I'll pray for him that he gets daily food. I will pray for him that people do not abuse him because he's without parents. I'll pray for him that he'll get his education. I'll pray for him that like his regular daily needs will be met because that is in fact a crapshoot in his world. I, I would pray that they would get water in their village. You would go for several miles, village, 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 and one of them would have a well. And so all of them walk several miles each day to get their water. And I would pray that he would get water. And I thought, I wonder how he'll pray for me. Well, he'll pray for me the same way because that's all he knows. He doesn't know of a world different than his. And so he would be praying that God would give me my daily food and maybe give me water. And it brought me to this place of recognizing, just like you, I don't have a daily need for sustenance from God. But God would like me to recognize my utter dependency upon him in that way. And so Jesus taught us to pray this prayer for two reasons. I think this, this part of the prayer. Now remember, we start off, the first half of the prayer was about positioning ourselves before God. Our Father in heaven. You have a Father, listen, we have a Father God in heaven whose name is holy and powerful. Demons flee at his name. Uh, man, the world shifts at the name of God. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. We hold on to Father God with one hand and holy, sovereign, powerful God with the other, and our God. We, Lord, he teaches us to pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, I'm obsessed with my own kingdom. I'm obsessed with my own will. Help me to set aside my kingdom and my will and to seek yours. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. And now we get into the mechanics of daily going after God. Here's my needs. Give me today my daily bread. And I want you to recognize that bread is a staple around the world. Every, every culture on earth eats bread. It's one of the few things that, uh, from a culinary standpoint, is global. And the first reason Jesus teaches us this is to teach us to govern our worries in this life through trust in our Father. What chokes out the work of God in you? Worries, the deceitfulness of riches, and the pleasures of this world. It is so natural for you and me. Here's what I know about us. We want to walk by faith. We just don't want to have to. We want to lean on God. We just don't want to have to. And so we, we live our lives with the illusion that we don't need to lean on God because I have the bread I'm going to eat tomorrow. It's already in my house. You have the groceries you're probably already going to eat tomorrow. But this is a much bigger deal than that. This is the sustenance, the need of your life. Here's what Jesus wants you to remember. He wants you to govern over your worries. What do you worry about? 90%, this is science now, 90% of the things you worry about will never happen. Now, you might be like the guy with garlic around his neck and go, this keeps the vampires away. And we go, dude, there's no vampires. See, it works. Uh, you may be that way about your worries. I tell you, 90% of things you worry about never happen. See, worrying works. It pushes them away. No, it doesn't work. It sucks the life out of you, and it destroys you. 90% of the things you worry about will not happen. 5% of the things you worry about are going to happen, and there's nothing you can do about it. So you're worrying 100% of your worries for 5% of the things you actually can impact. It's a waste of our time. And Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to recognize your utter dependence upon God. And I want you to say, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life. Now give me today what I need for tomorrow. If you go to the end of chapter 6 in Matthew, Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Every day has enough trouble of its own. And this is why I urge you to get alone with God in the morning and you pray this prayer, God, today, give me the bread I need today. Lord, I'm utterly dependent upon you. I don't know what phone call I'm going to get today. I don't know what my kids are going to do today. I don't know what diagnosis I might get today. I don't know what's going to happen at my job today. Lord, I don't know what emergency is going to need me today. So give me today the bread I need today. Now, you don't need groceries. You probably have those. But you do need to push your worries away. You need to recalibrate so that the deceitfulness of riches does not draw you away and, and kill the work of God in your life. 
You need God to help you so that you are not chasing after the desires of this life and losing your way with God. Give me today my daily bread. Lord, help me focus today. There's a powerful reality one day at a time. The peace of God will come. The the fear will be pushed away. We must govern our anxieties. We must govern over our worries because all I need to really worry about is what I have right now, and that's today. And the Lord will be with me. He will help me today. He will give me what I need today. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Uh, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding is going to guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. This is what Jesus is asking you to do. The first reason he wants to teach us how to pray this way is so that we will govern over our worries through trust in our Father. I I translate Philippians 4 this way. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. And let the peace of God rule and reign in your heart. And so that's the first part of the prayer. The second reason he wants us to pray this prayer is a completely different reason. It's in John chapter 6. Now, if you, if you study the idea of bread throughout the Bible, you find yourself recognizing that bread is a description of what God pours out in our lives, and even more focused, it's the person of Jesus. Jesus is the bread of life. So if you go to John 6, and you look at me, uh, look at this passage with me, we're going to start at verse oh, 25, and I'm going to bounce around through this. But uh, what starts off in John 6 is that Jesus feeds 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. 5,000 men, uh, they didn't count the women and children. So you're feeding probably somewhere between eight and 13,000 people with five loaves of bread. And here's what happens after that, verse 25. When they found Jesus on the other side of the lake, they said, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate really good bread and you had your fill. He says, you're looking for me not because I'm the Messiah. You're looking for me because I've made a really good meal out there and you want more. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Drop down to verse, oh, what is that? Looks like 30. So they asked him, what sign will you give us that we may know and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven. Now, pause right there about manna. Exodus chapter 16, God gives them manna. Uh, he's He's got about 3 million people navigating through the desert, and they go, oh, no, we don't have any food. They start freaking out. And God says, Here's what you're going to do. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, there will be this layer on the ground, and it's going to be flaky, and it's going to be bread. I'm going to give you bread, and I'm going to give it to you every day. And here's what you're going to do. Every morning, you're going to go out, and you're going to collect enough bread for your family, but not more than that. And then on Friday, you're going to collect enough bread for your family for two days, because I'm not going to bring you that bread on the Sabbath. Okay? Now, God's not playing games with them. He's teaching them what he wants to teach you and me. Utter dependence upon me one day at a time. What happens? They go out in the morning and there's this thing on the ground. You might think, what's the word manna? They called it manna. The word manna means, what is it? They see this stuff on the ground and they go, what is it? And they go, that's what we'll call it. What is it? And they start eating it. It's honey. It's sweet. It's bread. But some of them, guess what they did? They didn't listen to God and they gathered up enough bread for two days. And when they woke up in the morning, there were maggots in their manna. Some of them, then on Friday, they didn't collect two days' worth. They went out Saturday morning to get more, and guess what? It wasn't there because God said, I want you to trust me, get it every day just for that day, and on Friday get two days' worth because on Saturday I want you to take the day off and rest knowing that I'll provide for you. This is what Jesus is teaching us about keeping the maggots out of our manna, okay? You, whatever your manna is, you're looking at it, You're not trusting God. You're managing it differently. And God says, I want you, listen, utter dependence upon me. So they bring up manna and they say, hey, 
uh, God gave us manna in the wilderness. Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said this, very truly I tell you, it's not Moses who gave you the bread of heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Listen to this. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus asked us to pray this way for two reasons. We got daily problems. We got worries. We have the deceitfulness of wealth. We have the desire for other things. He says, I want you to calibrate that. I want to help you govern over that by trusting in your Father every day, one day at a time. The second reason he taught us this is because he wants us to desire the true bread, the bread that is Jesus. They said, hey, give us that bread. He says, here I am. I am the bread of life. Here's what I know about you. The greatest single need in your life right now is more of Jesus. I don't know what's going on with you. Some of you are facing challenges economically. Some of you, your spouse has walked out and they filed for divorce and you don't know what you're going to do. Some of you have uh, prodigal children. They're adult kids uh, enslaved in addiction. Some of you are just facing diagnoses that are scaring the living daylights out of you. But here's what I know, no matter what your circumstances are, your number one need is the bread of life. You need more of Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who calms, who heals, who restores. Let me just give you an idea of the power of the Jesus life. Because here's what God wants to do for you. Okay, The second reason he has us pray this way is so that we will experience the bread of life, the, the person of Jesus, and we will start to live an eternal kind of life. This is the bread that lasts for eternity. God wants you, and, and he's inviting you and me to live an eternal kind of life, a Jesus kind of life. Can I tell you that Jesus never once worried about where his meal was going to come from? I hope you hear this next thing I want to tell you. God is inviting you to live a life, a Jesus kind of life, that is so unexplainable that only God can be the explanation for your life. That people would look at your life and it's not A plus B plus C. I see where that goes. D. That your life would have the fragrance of Christ, the provision of Jesus, the supernatural presence of Jesus, that all the rules change for you because you're living a supernatural Jesus kind of life. Example, one day they go to Peter and they go, hey, your, your dude, Jesus, hasn't paid the temple tax. You guys going to pay the taxes? And uh, Peter says, well, let me go talk to him. So he goes to Jesus. He says, hey, they're asking if we're going to pay our taxes. And Jesus says, well, Peter, who pays taxes, the king or the others? He said, well, the others. Jesus says, well, I'm the king. I shouldn't be paying taxes, but to keep everybody happy, let's pay our taxes. Here's what I want you to do, Peter. Take your fishing rod, go down to the lake, and the first fish you catch will have a four drachma coin in its mouth, and the temple tax is two drachma each. Take that coin and pay our taxes. Can I just ask you, if you're praying, you get alone with God tomorrow morning and you're on your knees and you're saying, God, I just want to meet with you. God, I need you. I, I, I want you to make me healthy in the private place. And God, by the way, I've got a, a $10,000 need. And you hear the Lord say, well, take your fishing rod and go out to Black Lake and uh, drop that thing in there. And the first fish you catch is going to have a mouthful of cash. Problem solved. Okay. Uh, I know that you're going to think, well, I'm as crazy as a preacher wearing a Hawaiian shirt when it's 27 degrees out this morning. Uh, I'm wearing this shirt because I refuse to admit that it's cold yet, and I want summer to last a little longer. Uh, you say, how about this one? Earlier in John 6, he feeds multiple thousands of people with five loaves of bread. Let me ask you a question. When the bread multiplied, were there fields of wheat that suddenly lost some wheat? Were there bins of flour somewhere that reduced and that bread was produced? Or did Jesus change the molecular structure of the five loaves so that it somehow reproduced? But I tell you this, everyone who ate said, that's the best bread I've ever had in my life. It was real bread. Jesus goes to a wedding. They run out of wine. 
socially humiliating for the bride and groom and their families. Jesus fills up big jars, ceremonial washing jars with water. Take that to the wine taster. The wine taster tastes it and goes, holy cow, that's the best wine on earth. Usually people serve the good stuff first, and when everybody's drunk, they bring out the cheap stuff. You've saved the best stuff to the end. Jesus knows how to change the molecular structure of water and turn it into wine. What God is inviting you to do is every day go before God and say, today, I need daily bread. Today, I need you, God, to alter the molecular structure of my life. Today, I need you to give me what I need for tomorrow. And I want my life, Father, to be so supernaturally kissed that the only explanation for my life is Jesus. I'm free in my, from my shame. I'm, I'm free from my addiction. My anxiety has been governed by my trust in my Father. Peace has come. I live in joy. My life is being transformed. I'm being kissed by God. And the only explanation for my life, people will say, what is up with you? Something's different. Well, there's only one explanation for my life. Jesus. And I want to feast on the bread of Jesus. Lord, give me this day more of Jesus. Lord, give me this day the life of Jesus. Give me an eternal bread that lasts forever. He said, you'll never hunger and you'll never thirst. God, satisfy the hungers of my soul so that I am well fed in you. Lord, give me water. Jesus said it this way in another case. He said, you're going to have rivers of living water flowing from your inmost being. You'll never thirst again. Every day, Jesus, give me this today. Lord, meet my needs. I got a crazy teenager. Lord, I got, a, I got chaos at work. Lord, I've got a real financial crisis going. Lord, my car won't run and I don't have the money to fix it. Whatever it is, give me this day my daily provision. And this day, give me more of Jesus. Lord, more of Jesus. I don't want maggots in my manna. I want to come to you every day for today's miracle. And I need more of Jesus. I got to tell you, I've been praying this way because I'm a little bit ahead of you, hopefully, as you get here on Sunday. And I've been praying this way, and I've been blown away at the peace of God as I, as I govern my worries with trust in our Father. And as I recognize that Christ wants to be present, powerfully present, in every part of my story today, today. I don't know what's going to happen to you the rest of the day. I don't know what tomorrow's bringing, but I know this. Jesus already knows. He's with you, and he wants to give you the Jesus kind of life right now, where the only explanation for the peace you're walking in, the only explanation for the provision that has been given to you is God. Aren't you hungry for a life that is so extraordinary that the only possible way to explain it is God? He's inviting you to live that way today, tomorrow, one day at a time. Here's what I want you to do to help you this week, okay? This is my request. It's a little weird. I want you to take communion every day for the next seven days to remind yourself that Jesus is the bread of life. There was one point where he's with the disciples and, and he says, uh, hey, beware the yeast of the Pharisees. And they're going, oh, man, we forgot to bring bread. He's, he's mad because we didn't bring groceries. And he says, what are you talking about? Do you not remember I fed 5,000 with a little bit of bread? I'm not talking about bread. I'm talking about your life. So if you're on one of those paleo, weird, some other kind of diets, there's some bread-type substance you're going to eat. It might be gluten-free, something weird. And here's what I tell you. Even Jesus can give you joy even if you eat like that. <laughs> but whatever that is, find some reasonable bread substitute. And if you're drinking water or some kind of smoothie or whatever, okay, I'm not talking about getting a Jesus wafer and a cup of juice. I'm talking about every day for the next seven. I want you to start today. At some point in your day, as you've got a piece of bread or some reasonable facsimile thereof, I want you to say, man, Jesus, I'm going to take a communion moment with you. I'm going to thank you for giving your body for me. 
that I can have the life of Jesus every day. And Lord, I'm going to take my next drink acknowledging that you shed your blood to redeem me and that the, the life of Jesus changes my life. Okay, you don't need to make big fanfare. You can do this quietly while you're having a meal with a bunch of people. You don't have to, hey, you know, create a spiritual moment. Every day for the next seven days. I can't tell by your faces. Give me a little wave if you're going to do that for me. Okay, seven days. A little bit of bread, a little bit of drink, something like that. It can be a, it can be a ding dong, okay? It can be a Twinkie. It does, doesn't matter. Uh, it's probably better to be a Twinkie than to be a paleo piece of cardboard, but whatever. <laughs> Jesus, thank you for your life. Thank you for the bread of life. Thank you for the shed blood that washes away my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for me. Let me pray for you. Lord, help us as we take this week and we say, I'm going to, I'm going to remember. Lord, I'm going to let you help me to push away and to govern over the worries of this life by trust in our Father. I'm going to cast all my cares on you because I know you care for me. And Lord, I'm also going to take a moment every day and and remember the bread of eternal life, Jesus, my Savior. And I'm going to ask you to give me more bread. Give me more of Jesus. Lord, as we take this uh, little exercise all week long, as we think about you, as we have a communion moment with you, would you meet us with the peace of God? Lord, may you pour out the peace of God that transcends comprehension. And may your peace guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Let us walk with you one day at a time. Lord, I pray that as we do that, you'll you'll help us to be positioned with our oikos, those 8 to 15 people who are on the front row of our lives, that we'll also be able to encourage them that God is with them today for what they need today, right now. And may the fragrance of Jesus in our lives be a fresh aroma to them to give them hope and encouragement and to help them find their way to you. And may all of that result in glory to the name that is above every name, King Jesus. Thank you, God. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.